My friends, what a blessing to have you with us. I love you. The Lord loves you, and it's a grace just to share this time with you, journeying in the Lord together. We're going to talk about how to listen to God today. Now, you talk to God, and they call that prayer. You talk even about listening to God, or that that might be a possibility, and they call you crazy. <laughs> Guys, part of our relationship with the Lord isn't just talking at Him all the time, but also listening to Him, especially when it comes to making big decisions in our lives. He speaks, but we have to learn how to listen. And it's not overly complicated. It's actually simple, because God wouldn't trick us like that, and He wouldn't say, listen to me. You have to have the secret knowledge to figure out how. No, no, no. But we have to be intentional about doing these simple things, and I have an incredible spiritual guide with us today to teach you how. So excited to share our guest with you. Thanks for being with us. Father Timothy Gallagher. <laughs> I'm really excited to have you here. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Praise God. Well, right <laughs> when you walk through the door, we had a, a pre-interview interview. interview. We, we had a pre-game interview, right? Uh, I, I just, I, hearing your voice, I'm like, wow. Because I've listened to all your stuff. One time I met a woman who said to me, you sound just like your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You sound like the same guy. <laughs> Yeah. I'm also really struck, and as I picked up on this in your podcast and, and your presence right now, you're very peaceful. You've worked on that. <laughs> well, that's just the way I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is beautiful, though. We, we, the the uh, expressions each person has when we give our lives to the Lord, He takes that thing that He loves about us and just brings that out, you know? You know, it's a beautiful thing to see as you meet different people who yeah. serve the Lord in various ways how every human trait, when it's redeemed or filled with Christ's grace, mm. becomes a blessing. So you may have a person who's dealt a lot with a lot of anger, mm. but when that is brought to Christ, it becomes energy for evangelization or awesome? for living. And I see this all over the place with people. Yeah, when we bring what we are to the Lord, every bit of our humanity, even the parts that we're maybe less, least happy about, He can use in wonderful ways. Even the broken parts. Yeah. Maybe right. almost above all the broken parts. <laughs> you know, uh, I've been reading Therese uh, recently, and uh, that's her secret. It's not her strength, it's her weakness that's her secret. Mm. And th her great discovery is that when you take that weakness, and instead of letting it d discourage you, and I've got to settle for less, you bring it to Jesus. That's where her elevator and all of that comes into it, you know. Then the Lord uh, mm. enters right there where we're weak, and that's where, as Paul says, we become strong. Mm. But there's a whole Copernican revolution there that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. The spiritual life is anything but boring. Oh, the, It's the ultimate adventure. Well, if you speak in terms of boring, <laughs> um, something I've heard Bishop Barron say that's kind of a nice way of saying it, and he's quoting um, von Balthasar, who speaks of the theodrama and the ego drama. Mm. The theodrama is God's plan for our lives and for the world. And then the ego drama is when I take control of my life uh, independently wow. of God, and he says, that's boring. But it's the theodrama that's really exciting. It is. It's that yeah. interplay of like, like well, the, the maker of the universe actually wants to interact with me, actually has something to say, actually leads me. Brought me into the world for at this time, in this place, with these people, with these talents, with this health, with this education, for a specific reason, because there's something you can do that nobody else can do. Mm. Think of the parents of St. Therese, whom I just mentioned. Uh, there were no other parents to raise that Therese. Mm. And, and that's true of every one of us. You know what, it's that famous line of uh, St. John Henry Newman. Um, God has given me some task that he has not given to another. Mm. I am necessary for his purposes. I have my mission. It's true, for, mm. true of, of all of us. I'm necessary for his purpose to have a mission. That goes to every phase in life. I, I was just reflecting on this this morning. My, um, my parents are watching my kids this weekend. And they left the house, and my teenage daughter is going through some stuff, just started crying. She's like, I miss Grandma. And my mom, at the same time she called me today, she's been reflecting on the lie that the devil often tells people as they get older that you're irrelevant, right? And, and I think we, we reduce relevance to utility in a secular sense. So I have this job, and people retire, and they feel like, well, my job's over, so therefore, no, 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 there, there's a, God's working through you in, right now, whether you're a kid or retired, or you have this job where it's really measurable, right, the accomplishments at the end of the day. Right now, He wants to work through you, and, and especially, i got to say this, it's felt inspired with, with people as you get older. 
the, the time and focus you give to your grandkids. Like, talk about relevance. Well, you can't even do that at other phases in your life. Something Pope Francis is saying repeatedly, you know, he'll always talk about grandparents. And he does mm -hmm. that because his own grandmother was very uh, central to his whole spiritual life and vocation. You know, one thing I've noticed, um, so I'm 68 now, if I can, you know, give that age. And um, I remember when I was in my 40s, and I had my wisdom figures. I had a wonderful spiritual director, uh, a wonderful doctor who was a good Catholic, and mentors in various ways, and they meant everything to me. And now I'm at the age where I see myself doing that for others. I mean, that's the gift that mm. only, only age can permit, mm. age and experience. Yes, amen. Yeah. This brings us perfectly to Ignatian spirituality, to what you do for a living. You know, if God wants to work through all that we are, uh, how do you listen to how he wants to do that so that we can participate in that? And, and give us a, just an overview of what you do for a living, how you fell in love with that, because you have a really unique kind of ministry. <laughs> and and what, what, it, what, what is Ignatian spirituality? How do you, just, yeah, how do you do what you do? <laughs> how do you help people well, listen to God? Twice, only twice in my life um, this has happened. It's just... Um, a powerful attraction towards something in the spiritual life mm. that I have not reasoned out, you know, by stages come to say this is important that I should pursue, but just a great energy within. And one was for the founder of my community, Venerable Bruno Lanteri, and his whole spirituality, which led to my joining this religious community. But the other was the Ignatian spiritual exercises, which are central to our work. Yeah. And I didn't know what they were. I heard about them. One of our um, men had made the 30-day retreat. I went to the library, got the book, couldn't make head nor tail out of it. Wow. You know, it's not really meant to be read like that. And then, uh, by God's grace, I was able to make the full Ignatian retreat just before final vows in diaconate. Mm -hmm. And that was life-changing, you know, that from there on, the, the energy for this just grew. But how the ministry that I'm doing now developed certainly wasn't something I ever planned. What happened was that after ordination, one of my classmates was assigned to our church, one of our churches near Buenos Aires in Argentina, and met, uh, there was a wonderful group of four Jesuits who did some of the best work ever done on discernment, and he got to know some of them and their writings. He came back, we had a conversation, and as he shared that, I realized there's a lot more here than I know, well, which led me to start formally studying it. And then I'll just share one experience. Yeah. Uh, it was a small group, um, and Every day, over eight days, for half an hour, I would speak on these 14 rules for discernment of Ignatius. And uh, we, it was electric. We all knew that, I knew that in the transmitting, and they knew that in the receiving, something powerful had happened. Mm -hmm. And it led to that group asking for many more retreats. What's happened, basically, is that when people learn this wisdom, as you said, it's not complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not simplistic. It's very right. rich but it's accessible, you can understand it, you can make it work in your life, and once you've learned it, you can't conceive of the spiritual life without it, mm. and you wanna share it with other people. So that's what's driven it, just that people kept wanting more and more and more. You know, just the way you're articulating your own story, uh, it, it shows something I, I, I wanna get better at myself, that you're profoundly aware of how God is moving in your life, and that these experiences aren't just random. Right? And, I, and I think a lot of Christians believe God loves them and is working in their lives, but they don't process that. They don't pause, take a deep breath, and realize, oh, that was God today. You know, like that experience of being attracted to something without having to think about it. Right when you said that, this never even occurred to me. It's like, oh yeah, there's like three or four things in my life that have been like that. Well, that was the Lord. Okay, if we wanna, <laughs> right? if we wanna put that in Ignatian terms, but this is diving very deeply into his teaching, yeah. there are, he says, three main ways in which God answers the question. So, Lord, I'm facing this choice. I love you. I want to do your will. Mm -hmm. I don't know which option you want. I want to discern it. So this career, that career, this vocation, that vocation, so forth. So Ignatius says that God may answer in one of three ways. Sometimes he simply makes it clear beyond any doubting. You just know. You just know. I think my own vocation to priestly religious life was of that kind. Mm -hmm. There was no one dramatic moment, but it, just a deep certitude, mm -hmm. you know, as I was going through uh, schooling and getting ready for college. Uh, but that's not probably the most common way God answers right, it, but right. sometimes he does. It's sure easy when he does. 
I kind of wish he'd always do it that way. <laughs> okay. Well, then you're raising another question. You know, Lord, I want to do your will. Why, why do you make it so hard? Why are you telling me? Yeah. And the answer to that, there are probably many answers, but one very central answer to that is that if you go through a real process of discernment, mm -hmm. and let's say you spend some months, you know, uh, discerning an important cho choice, mm -hmm. and ideally with uh, some kind of guidance so that the church is, <clears throat> excuse me, the church's um, rich tradition on discernment can be mediated to you. Two things happen. One is at the end, you have the clarity that you need. You know which choice God wants. But the other thing ha would not happen unless you went through that process. You grow spiritually. You're in a different place spiritually after a discernment than you are before it because you've learned how to recognize God's voice in a, in a whole new way. Mm. You've been through ups and downs and you've learned how to make sense out of them. You, you're more in tune with how God answers. So mm. that's at least one of the main reasons, I think, why God calls us to that. Um, and I've seen this over and over again in people's lives. That's a beautiful thing to think of, because sometimes you feel like you're, you're, you're suffering through something like a discernment. And really, it can, be, it can become agonizing, right? Some of these decisions that we have to make and that agony leads you to instantly say, why are you abandoning me, right? Like a kid crying in its crib to be picked up. Uh, why would you leave me alone? Why would you let me cry this long? And there's like, nothing can be further from the truth. It's, it's actually uh, a, a really special opportunity to grow in the spiritual life. Mm. But you, you need the church's tradition. And Ignatius is certainly not the only one who speaks about discernment, but he certainly is the primary figure in our rich Catholic tradition. So what are the, the rules of discernment? And I know, we'll dive into some of them. Can't get to all of them. I, you, you need to, I, we're gonna leave you with all his stuff, okay? There's, uh, the reason I, I knew his voice so well when he walked in the doors because I've listened to it all. I'm gonna tell you where to get all of it so you can listen to all these rules for discernment. Totally worth your time. Um, <clears throat> what, what kind of decisions do these things apply to? What do they not apply to? I mean, I, I know Catholics who have taken it so far that it's like, okay, Lord, what movie do you want me to watch tonight? And I'm, I don't, I'm genuinely wondering, like, does the Lord care what movie you watch tonight? Like, you got to stop and discern that? You know, tuna fish or bologna? Like, I, I, I don't, you know, like, the Lord, I don't think the Lord cares if you have tuna fish or bologna, right? But uh, where, where's the line here where we say it's worth stopping and not just following my gut, but check in with the Lord. What do you want? How do I figure it out? So St. Francis de Sales, who is basically Ignatian, mm. um, addresses that very question. Here's one way to say it. If the discernment takes longer than the actual thing you're discerning, then you don't need to discern it that way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> DeSales said that? Um, I that's, love the wisdom of saints. It's so simple and clear. That's, that's my summary of what he says. Yeah. And what I would say is this. Um, <laughs> let's say that, uh, um, Let's say that you've promised to spend time with a friend this evening after work, you know, who really needs you, going through something difficult in his life. And, um, and then at work, um, the boss approached you during the day and said, look, we're really under pressure to get this done. I'm sorry to ask this of you, but could you spend the evening, get this done so that tomorrow morning we can go ahead with it. And now you're driving home and you, you just want to do the Lord's will. Mm. You've got a friend who needs you, and you've got a request from the boss. Okay, what do you do in this case? Mm -hmm. So what you do is, you, even while you're driving, maybe you're, you've got 15 minutes before you get home, lift your heart in prayer to the Lord. Ask the Lord for guidance. Review the factors involved in the one choice and the other. How important is it that I be there tonight with my friend? You know, could that wait till tomorrow evening, or is it really important now? How much pressure is there really on this project? Is there another? You review the factors involved. You make your best decision. Doesn't mean it's going to be the perfect decision. You make your best decision. God never asks more than our best. That's another principle. Once you've made it, follow it through with peace. Don't keep ang ang agonizing over this. Should I? I think yeah. you've made your best decision. Pursue it. And then if you want to be Ignatian about it, review it afterwards and learn from it so that another mm. time. Now, what I'm describing there, prayer, review, uh, choice, execution, and, re and you know, examining the thing afterwards, 
it's really just a, a way of describing what St. Thomas would call the uh, exercise of the supernatural virtue of prudence. Mm -hmm. Now, and that's not complicated. It doesn't, you don't have to go off to a retreat house for this and so on. And we're doing this all day long. Now, what would happen if we started to live our lives like that? You know, Paul says, Jesus is Lord. Amen. If we live like this, Jesus will really be Lord of our lives, and not abstractly, but very concrete. I'll just give you one more example. So I have finished saying the morning mass in the parish, and let's say uh, it's about nine o'clock now, and there's a, a meeting at nine o'clock in the parish office, and they're waiting for me to come. As I'm walking across the parking lot to the parish rectory uh, offices, a woman approaches me and says, Father, I, I really need to speak to you. Could I speak to you? Okay, what do I do? Yeah. You know, um, is it the Lord's will that I go to the meeting? They're waiting for me. This woman has a need. And if you live this way, you can get so that um, you're doing those five steps that I just said, but it's very simple. You know, you're just looking at it. You, you see where the greater need is. Uh, you make your choice. You pursue it. Later on, you review it. Yeah, sure, we have, we, we have some time now. Or um, if I know the person and I know that the person doesn't really need me that urgently right mm -hmm. now and they really do me. Okay, so that, that's, that's, that's how Jesus is Lord. Mm. You're, you're checking with, his, with, with him on, on these relatively little things and that makes him Lord of your life. Just asking him to be, Lord, help me, help me glorify you in this moment, in this decision. And give yeah. yourself the time, instead of just being reactive, so often we go through life with all these urgent things pressing in on us and we're just reactive. It's like playing racquetball with your day. You know, a woman said to me after we went through this teaching, she said, before, exactly as you've said, before I was reacting, now I'm responding. Mm. There's a big difference. We think, I don't have time to respond or think through it. It's like, do you know how much time you waste well, when you don't reflect? <laughs> yeah, now discernment is not isolated in the spiritual life. Discernment is only possible because discernment is essentially a relationship with God. Mm. Uh, discernment is only possible where there's a life of prayer. Mm. Now, that life of prayer has to be filtered through you know, uh, the nuances of one's vocation. A mother with three young children is in a different situation from a woman whose children are all you know, married and on their own. But we've got to pray. I remember uh, a woman came to me once and wanted help with uh, discernment. And I just asked her you know, about her prayer. And there really wasn't too much formal prayer. And so I asked her, would you be willing to spend 20 minutes a day in prayer? Kind of. But then we had something to work with. So, so prayer and the life of the sacraments, all of that's the substratum which Beautiful. permits discernment. So give me a crash course here. Someone shows up at your door at the Lanteri Center. Google it, Lanteri Center, great place for retreats, for discernment. Um, they, they want uh, to figure out what God wants for their life. They have a big decision in front of them. Or they're thinking about priesthood versus marriage and a girl's asking them out on a date. And it's like, I, I got to decide a direction, at least to discern my next steps, right? I don't have a thir 30 days. Ignatius would have 30-day retreats he would do, which um, if there's anything I envy my celibate brothers and sisters for, boy, that's awesome. <laughs> I might not have an eight-day. Let's say I have a three-day or uh, 10 minutes left of the show. Well, give me the crash course. Right. And those big decisions and how to hear God. One parenthesis first. Yeah. Uh, it is possible to make the entire 30-day retreat without ever leaving home. Okay. So that what a person does is that he commits to an hour of prayer every day, some kind of examining and journaling of that, and then a weekly meeting with the director. Many people do it. It's a lovely way to make the... the Beautiful. You can make the full retreat or any part of it in, okay. that, in those circumstances. Oh, close. I'm signing up. I'm signing up for that. <laughs> how do I sign up for that, honestly? Um... Call the Lantary Center. Lantary, okay. Yeah, yeah. All you Beautiful. need is somebody who's competent to, to guide it, okay. and, and you can do it. Many people do it. So the person is facing an important discernment. What do I do? Yeah. Well, if the person is coming to speak with a priest, he's doing the first thing right, I would say. He or she yeah. is doing the first thing right. And that is essentially to reach out to the church for the help of the church's rich tradition on how to discern. You don't want to be alone with it if it's an important discernment. So I'd say that's the first thing. Look for somebody who can help you. Now, if it's a vocational discernment, any significant thing like this, you really don't want to do that alone. And then what that person is going to help you to do is to be praying. You've got to be praying. And as you're praying, uh, here, here's what Ignatius came to see. If you pray frequently, regularly, faithfully, 
And secondly, if you are attentive to what's going on in your heart and your thoughts mm -hmm. as you're praying, you can come to see where God's will is in the, in the choice. So what the guide... Be attentive to, what, to what's happening inside of you while you pray. Exactly. Let's, uh, let's go back to uh, Ignatius' own experience, how all this got started. Yeah. So he has been very far from God until the age of 30. It's an Augustine story. And then he's wounded in battle, and he has a long... A cannonball, right? Cannonball shatters his right leg. There are three surgeries, and after the third surgery, he has five more months before he can use his leg. Wow. So he begins to... He asks for reading. He has in mind the sort of novels of chivalry and romance and so forth that he was used to. But his sister-in-law gives him the only book she has. One is a life of meditations on the life of Christ, and the other a volume with lives of the saints. Ignatius begins somewhat unwillingly, but he begins to read. Two things start to happen. He spends hours and hours, he says, sometimes up to two, three, four hours, exploring, pondering in his heart how he's going to win the heart of a woman. He never names her. In all likelihood, this was the uh, Catherine, the younger daughter, uh, the um, younger sister of the king of Spain. Ignatius might have seen her on a couple of occasions wow. earlier. So wildly unrealistic. Completely, because he's never even going to have access to meet her. Yeah. But he gets thoroughly engaged in it. There's energy in it, and hours get spent like this. Now he's reading about Saints Dominic, Francis, all, another mm -hmm. kind of heroism. Now he's starting to spend hours thinking about, well, what if I were to pursue that way? Mm -hmm. And what he notices finally is this. Both sets of thoughts, while I'm actually thinking about them, let's call it the worldly project and the holy project, they're both engaging. They awaken energy and enthusiasm. Mm. But he now notices that after he sets them aside and goes on with the day in the one case and the other, the first set of thoughts about the worldly pursuit leave him empty, unhappy. His heart isn't nourished. Uh, mm. there's, uh, there's, there's some trouble there. Whereas when he's been thinking about living like the saints and goes on with the day, his heart always remains happy and content. Wow. And once he sees this, it becomes clear to him that that first set of thoughts, which are engaging but leave him empty, that's not where God's leading. Mm -hmm. The other is. And that's the origin of his whole teaching on discernment. By paying attention to what's wow. going on in our hearts and the related thoughts, we can see where God is and where God's leading. Wow. And the 14 rules equip us to do that. Wow. It's kind of simple. Right? It reminds me of the Bruce Lee quote. He said before... Before studying martial arts, a punch was just a punch. A kick was just a kick. And then it became this intricate art. And after doing it 10,000 hours, a punch is just a punch again. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, the reason why this speaks so much to people is because Ignatius is not adding anything to the spiritual life. We're all going through these attractions and resistances on the level of the heart. Thoughts, should I do this? Maybe I may just, all of this is going on. But we don't have a way to understand it. We don't even have a vocabulary for it. So when Ignatius steps in there and says, look, this is what's been happening, and this is how you can know what's of God and not of God, and this is what you should do and shouldn't do in that situation, it's a liberation for people because, oh, that's what's been going on. Now I see it. That word liberation, I mean, you, you entail, this is actually what I think first drew me to the, what was, it, was it the podcast? I forget where I even first heard you. It was back in the in the audio cassette days, I don't know what, right? But it was setting captives free, which is a really unique subtitle for something on discernment. And why, yeah, why did you give it that subtitle? Because essentially Ignatius's 14 rules are about understanding and knowing how to overcome what is, I think, uh, for most dedicated people, that's probably going to be most people listening to us. Yeah the main obstacle in the spiritual life. When we get discouraged and disheartened and we can start to pull back, Ignatius calls that spiritual desolation. So, Jesus in the synagogue, chapter 4 uh, of Luke, you know, and proclaiming his mission, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and let the oppressed go free. Mm. Jesus didn't come that you and I should be held hostage to these discouraging lies of the one Ignatius calls the enemy. Mm. He came to set captives free. So I want to say this to anyone listening. If you've been listening, or excuse me, if you've been living with a kind of heaviness in the spiritual mm -hmm. life and a kind of discouragement, and you've, and I say this with great reverence, because with goodwill, um, well, maybe this is what the Lord is asking of me in my spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And in eternity, I can hope to experience joy in the Lord. Then know for sure 
that you are called to freedom from these discouraging lies and tactics of the enemy. Jesus came to set captives free. And mm. these 14 rules are an unparalleled resource to help you do that. I'd ask you to rattle them off, but they're probably, they're probably all a bit... I can do that if you can want. I, yeah, I'd actually like to hear just to give people a, a quick sense of what these rules are. Okay. But again, I love how you boil them all back down to um, that this is about being in touch with your own heart, which is actually harder than people think. Like, what's actually going to make me happy? What's actually giving me the real peace, uh, uh, not of a worldling, <laughs> but the real peace of a Christian, which is deeper and truer, which is going to give me real joy, and to not be afraid of the answers, right? So much a lack of faith, a lack of, which comes from a lack of prayer time. Uh, if someone's discerning religious life and they're terrified about the idea because they're afraid God's taking something from them. It's like all these little things to work out to find out, no, no, here's my real peace. Um, yeah, thanks for that. That's a great key for unlocking what all these are. All right, give us a quick, a quick yeah. overview, or, or at least of a couple of them, so right. we get more of a feel for what they let's, are. Let's get a couple of them. So, just spiritual desolation. So, um, just depends on how much time I have here. Well, we got about four or five minutes left. So, yeah, give us a quick, just a all few right. of them so we get a feel, so, and then we'll tell them where to go to get them all. So, here's a man who's been getting closer to the Lord in the last year, and he's actually starting to go to daily Mass on his lunch hour at work. Uh, it's getting more frequent. He started listening to a rosary app on his commute home. And in the evening, uh, before retiring, he's gotten in the habit of reading from Scripture for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, makes a simple examine, and kind of ends his day that way. Um, the last few days, work has been difficult. There have been tensions. Uh, it's kind of discouraging. And he sort of let some of his prayer go, just disheartened by this, didn't even get to uh, lunch hour, just didn't bother going to Mass. And, Driving home, uh, didn't even put on the rosary app and just listened to music. Okay, now it's 10 o'clock. Let's say he's alone at his desk in his room, and there's the Bible. And he doesn't feel God's closeness, doesn't feel energy for prayer, nothing in him wants to pick that up. In front of the other hand on the desk is the phone. Everything in him wants to pick it up in a way that he knows, to use Ignatius' term, can become low and earthly. Mm. Okay, so right here, this is where Ignatius Low is with and it. earthly. Yeah, he yeah. Is, he's experiencing spiritual desolation, just a heaviness or discouragement on the so spiritual level. He finds himself in, the, in a battlefield he didn't expect to find himself in. Yeah, actually, and we're there every day. Yeah. And there's nothing to be afraid of in this. Mm. So the first thing Ignatius says to him is famous rule five, eight words. In time of desolation, never make a change. So I'll say it again. Mm. In time of desolation, Never make a change. That rule five tells him, pick up the Bible the way you always do. Mm. Chances are, if he does, that'll be the end of the desolation. He may never even touch the phone that night. Wow. Okay, um, rule 13 is another key one. Don't be alone. When you're experiencing these kinds of burdens in the spiritual life, don't be alone. Find a competent spiritual person and put it into words. Actually, these mm -hmm. are just two of the 14, but if a person puts these two rules into practice... Change your life. Don't make changes in time of desolation, and don't be alone with the burden. Find a competent spiritual person and speak. That'll get you safely through any spiritual darkness you may ever experience in the spiritual life. Now, that's just two of the four. Wow. Simple and beautiful. So much of life comes down to actually doing the simple things, right? That people might hear and say, well, duh. To which I say, duh. So do it. <laughs> Take note. Be intentional about doing these Simple, powerful things. Okay, you, you, you whet our appetite here. Tell us every place to go to get all this stuff and your great summaries of, of Ignatian spirituality. How do people get access to this and go on the full or even make a retreat with you guys? So I have a website, which is okay. just frtimothygallagher.org. frtimothygallagher.org. Yeah, all the materials are there. But in terms of podcasts, those are unformed. Yeah, uh, you can excellent. listen to them there. And uh, the other app where you can find them is Discerning Hearts, which is a free app and a wonderful resource. And if you go on that, tap on Spiritual Formation, uh, speakers come up, tap on My Image, and it'll lead you to all of this stuff. Um, and then books, um, the, the Discernment of Spirits and Ignatian Guide to Everyday Living will take you through all 14 rules, uh, chapter by chapter. There's one for people who are married, Discernment of Spirits in Marriage. Oh, really? Applying it to right. a marriage. And there are many books on this now. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. You're very welcome. And for your witness and for your great peace and for practicing what you preach. 
because it shines through who you are. And I'm just, I'm really grateful. Well, and thank you for to having have you me on. here. Yeah. And my brothers and sisters, the Lord loves you so much that he actually has a plan for your life. <laughs> that he speaks to you. That when you take time and you're intentional, you can start to notice that God, that you're important enough to him that he acts in your everyday life. But you have to be intentional about noticing and following. We love you. We'll see you next time. I'm going to dive. I'm going to have you back. I'm going to dive in a little deeper to what this interaction with God looks like, not just for the big decisions, but for prayer in the everyday. We'll see you next time. Man, wasn't that great? Listen, if you don't want to be happy, be sure not to subscribe. But if you want a more joyful life, the kind of life that God created you for, the kind of life Jesus promised when he said, I came to give you life to the full, then make sure you hit subscribe and share this channel with everybody you know.